subchorionic hematoma. What is this bleeding or bruise in the uterus? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and today I want to talk about something that can be relatively common but scary when it happens and it's called a subchorionic hematoma. This is also casually known as a bruise or a blood spot behind the uterus in between where the baby and the uterus is and there is a lot of concern over what this means. So I'm going to dive into this today. First of all, I am a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist, so I am board certified in both OBGYN and REI. This channel exists to educate you about fertility and your body and specifically around reproduction. So please subscribe if you are interested and follow along. First of all, what is a subchorionic hematoma? A subchorionic hematoma is an area of bleeding where the placenta is trying to implant. So it's between the uterine wall and the gestational sac or the chorion where the baby is. The way I describe this to every patient is if we can imagine you have your blood vessels inside your uterus. So let's pretend this is the wall of the uterus and back behind them are all these blood vessels which normally you know, grow a lining and you can see them bleed when you have a period. What happens when your embryo comes and implants, it does more than just stick there. In order to form that placenta, what the placenta truly is, is it's a connection between the maternal and the fetal blood vessels. That way, mom and baby can have a blood supply connection. Well, in order for this to happen, this little embryo and that trifectoderm or that placenta has to secrete certain enzymes, proteases, things that eat away at the wall of the uterus and the outside of these blood vessels to allow this connection to happen. And sometimes this can happen incompletely and you get a little bleeding blood vessel that allows a little pocket of blood to go behind the sac where the baby is. Here is a picture and you can see this white arrow is pointing at the area where the SCH or the subchorionic hematoma is located. So first of all, in general, subchorionic hematomas are found in about four to eight percent of all pregnancies. So it's overall a low finding. One of the only clinical signs you can have can be bleeding in the pregnancy. Now, bleeding in a pregnancy can be a subchorionic hematoma. It can be from cervical trauma, like if you had intercourse or something on the outside of the cervix was friable. It could be from an ectopic pregnancy, a pregnancy in an abnormal location can cause bleeding inside the uterus, or it could be the start of a miscarriage. So obviously having bleeding in pregnancy is very scary. One of the causes could be an SCH. So if you have bleeding in early pregnancy, very often you will get a ultrasound. And then on the ultrasound, this is one of the things we are looking for. Initial early research suggested pregnancy complications from an SCH. So it was considered high risk and some people were put on bed rest after one was found. So some of these pregnancy complications included pregnancy loss, premature rupture of membranes, placental abruption, or fetal growth restriction. These things sound terrible and obviously you want to decrease the risk any way that you could. Now, what we know is that in bigger studies done recently, there actually does not appear to be pregnancy adverse outcomes in pregnancies that had an SCH. So let's break down a couple of these. Two of these papers were published in the, what's called the Green Journal, which is the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and it has this nice green cover, therefore the name. It's considered the premier journal in the OBGYN world. These were looking at the same cohort and looking at there was an increased odds of either pregnancy loss, so before 20 weeks losing the pregnancy, or some of those pregnancy complications like growth restriction, abruption, PPROM after 20 weeks. And overall in both groups, no. Meaning there was no higher incidence of pregnancy complication in people who were found to have an SCH. So in this study, over 2,000 women met the inclusion criteria, almost 400 of them had an SCH. So there was a prevalence of around 17%, which is higher than previously reported. Now, this was determined on first ultrasound, so granted, some people do not seek prenatal care until later, and subchorionic hematomas tend to resolve as the placenta fully takes over. So, so this is typically a finding you are seeing on early ultrasound examination. The people who did have subchorionic hematomas did have an earlier ultrasound, most of them at six weeks versus eight to nine weeks, which was standard for the rest of the group, and 30% of them had vaginal bleeding. So hypothetically, this prevalence could be higher because people had vaginal bleeding, therefore called their doctor, got in for an ultrasound, and were seen sooner. So this is reassuring. 
Now, what about IVF pregnancies? So this was published in Fertility and Sterility, which is the leading journal in my field. So when you think about infertility, overall, this is looking at outcomes from IVF patients that found to have an SCH. This study followed previous studies, which reported a higher incidence of SCHs in IVF pregnancies than in the general population. So in this study, over 1,000 people met the inclusion criteria, and almost 200 had an SCH, so the prevalence was 18%. So again, higher than that 4 to 8%. Of course, in IVF studies, we do ultrasounds super early. Almost everybody I know does a first ultrasound somewhere between five and a half to six and a half weeks. So regardless of having symptoms or not, we are looking. Secondarily, this study also supported the idea that there was no higher risk of pregnancy complication. So the chance of live birth, of miscarriage, of birth weight of the infant, those were not different. So this is reassuring. Now a further study looked at the IVF population and factors that may be associated with an increased trend of an SCH. And this is really interesting. Since we are monitoring all these people a little bit earlier in pregnancy, it is a good time to collect data. This is published in JARG, the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics, another really great high-quality evidence journal. This study looked at 200 pregnancies from fresh embryo transfers. Now, this is really important because many of us do very few fresh embryo transfers. If we remember what this means, this means you go through IVF, you get one month's group of eggs to grow, you take them out of the body, you fertilize them, make embryos, and then instead of doing genetic testing or freezing the embryos and doing frozen embryo transfers, which a lot of us do much more commonly, myself included, what actually happens is that the best embryo on day five was chosen put into the body and the rest of them are frozen. That's considered a fresh transfer. So this was over 200 cycles with fresh transfers. In this study, 30% of patients had a subchorionic hematoma. One of the top factors they found was embryo quality, specifically the troph ectoderm or the outside of the placenta. Here is an example of three blastocysts. These are day five to six embryos, which we would transfer into the uterus. You can see them labeled A, B, and C. A is the best grading. We always think of this as school letter grades. So we're looking at the outer rim of cells. A is the best, equal and symmetric. B is good, average, as in school. It's pretty even, but there's a little bit of fragmentation or unevenness and C is fair. It has developed, it has expanded, but there's much more irregularity. Embryos that had a B and C trophectoderm grading had a much higher incidence of a subchorionic hematoma than those with an A. So this tells us that it may be something about the trophectoderm or the placenta that is controlling that implantation factor, perhaps causing it to be slightly dysregulated and contributing to the higher incidence. Does this mean we wouldn't transfer B or C embryos? Absolutely not, but there may be something on an embryonic level that is contributing. This might support another study that we know, which is the effect of first trimester subchorionic hematoma on pregnancy outcomes after IVF ICSI. In this study, the prevalence of subchorionic hematoma was 12%, and there was no change in live birth rate or pregnancy loss rate. However, there was an association with subchorionic hematoma and weight or growth restriction, which if we think about what an SCH may be representing, it might mean that there's less of an ideal placenta connection. Potentially that could lead to lower birth weight if we can't get from mom to baby as well as we could. Very interesting in the study, SCH was much more common in fresh embryo transfers than in frozen. So 16% of patients having a fresh transfer had an SCH versus 5% with a frozen. This is why many of us are doing frozen transfers. One of the reasons is that you can synchronize the uterine and the embryo environment better. Another is you decrease the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And third, we see improved fetal outcomes. So when it comes to birth weight, that's a major one for us. The likely reason is that the high estrogen environment, each egg that's growing in an IVF cycle makes estrogen. That estrogen environment probably changes the inside of the uterus and makes it more difficult or different when that placenta tries to implant in. And this could cause a higher incidence of SCH, could potentially cause birth weight issues, and it is one thing that we have consistently seen in studies is that a frozen transfer might mitigate those risks because it puts the estrogen levels back in a more normal zone. Overall, SCH, you might find if you have vaginal bleeding, you have a higher prevalence, maybe a 30% chance of having an SCH, but recent data supports that there's no higher risk of pregnancy loss, and that should make you feel okay. What do you do about it? First of all, I tell my patients usually to stop any blood thinners they potentially are on. So if you're on aspirin or Lovenox, you want to talk to your doctor about it. Don't just blindly stop, but that's definitely a phone call to your doctor. 
You also want to stop anything that could inhibit that implantation any further of those early placenta stages. Remember that placenta is not fully attached in until nine to 10 weeks. So we want to think about really heavy, vigorous exercise, intercourse. We don't want to be doing those things. I want that placenta to really be able to latch on well to that blood supply. doesn't mean you have to be on full bed rest. I don't put patients on bed rest, but I do put them on what we call pelvic rest. Nothing in the vagina until we know that placenta is all the way grown in. And then usually watchful waiting. So proper counseling that bleeding can be normal, telling patients what miscarriage level bleeding is versus SCH bleeding. Sometimes SCH reabsorbs, sometimes it will bleed. So not to be scared. However, if you ever have bleeding in early pregnancy, you always want to let your doctor know. It could be one of those other factors, and an ultrasound is almost always warranted to make sure things are fine, especially if the pregnancy has not been documented to be in the uterus. So if you're early pregnant and you haven't gone into your first visit, this buys you an earlier evaluation. I hope this video helps one of the top questions that I get. As always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or check out the As a Woman podcast for more fertility-related facts. Thanks, friends.